হরতালে শুরু করার আগে তাহলে শুরু করার আগে তাহলে ওই অ্যাডমিট অল করে দিতে তাহলে সবাই রেডি তো দেবী বাবু রেডি তো আমাদের রেডি রেডি দুজন সারি ঢুকে গেছে দুজন সারি ঢুকে গেছেন হ্যাঁ নিলাম শুদা প্রিন্সিপাল স্যার কেও বলছি দুজন সারি ঢুকে গেছেন আমাদের তো ওকে 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 হুম তো হুম লেটস স্টার্ট দেন হ্যাঁ ওকে ওকে তাহলে হরি Respected faculty members, dear students and viewers from all part of the country, welcome to the public lecture series organized by the Department of Microbiology, Surendranath College. On behalf of the organizing committee, I welcome you all to the last and final day of the webinar series titled COVID-19 Second Wave Evolution Risk and Vaccines. The webinar was previously postponed due to cyclone yash and today we are back again i am your host devdeep das gupta a faculty member at the department of microbiology with the covid 19 pandemic continuing to spread in the several part of the world the severe acute respiratory syndrome corona virus 2 is evolving to evade our immune system several new designated variants of concern have been reported from the united kingdom south africa and now in india which seem to be more infectious than the original yuhan strain in this frightful backdrop department of microbiology surendranath college has come forward with a webinar series to understand the evolution of sars cov 2 virus its double mutant variant the impact of second wave and finally about the vaccination process for building up immunity against covid in our previous session we have heard a comprehensive lecture from professor dhruvo jyoti chattopadhyay and professor sujoy kumar dasgupto on this note today we have with us dr shatodol das a consultant microbiologist at the peerless hospital and bk roy research center at kolkata and dr partha sarathi roy at an associate professor at the department of biological science aisar kolkata so before going into the detail i would now like to request our principal sir professor indronil kaur to deliver his inaugural note over to you sir Hello. Hello. Am yes, I sir. audible? Please continue. Please continue, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Very good afternoon to everybody. It's a wonderful occasion when we have found that it is there is a this, we have shown our series of concern about the doubts and the deficiencies in the knowledge background of different people in the in and around us. we have tried to create a sensation by informing everybody about the pros and cons of the second wave and the requirement of vaccination and definitely by this time when the second wave is showing a downtrend downward trend we definitely understand that 
the value of vaccination is quite important to us. Vaccine, the people who have taken their complete vaccination are being reported as a protected person. And if at all they get it, get the disease, the disease is not severe. So that's how the protection gives a strong impetus in the mind of the people in general. But still there are people who are not at all interested about the vaccination. And I find in different countries, they are offering different things uh, to the people who are to be vaccinated or to lure them for the vaccination. But in our country, the vaccination process has slightly been jumbled up because it's a huge task to be taken up by the government and the public, public sectors. So thus, there is some mess in between, but I hope everything will be sorted out properly so that every time and be protected like the other countries who have done it. But in this background, I still have a doubt. I don't know. I'm, I'm with, with this Corona and the things affecting the, the rural Bengal in uh, the seaside areas of Bengal. Um, presently, today I am on a visit to for the relief works in Midna, West Midnapur district. That is how I'm just standing on the roadside and I'm addressing to you all. By, and I, but I understand that this is really an important thing, but I have a doubt. I hope this by the end of this session, this will be cleared up. Recently, there was a there was an issue that if there is a mixture of vaccination, like Covid and Covaxin, does it have a better effect, or it has a composite effect, or what sort of effect it is? If there is a mismatch or a co-match type of vaccination done. If it gives a better protection, then definitely it is our requirement for the next. And if it is doubtful, why it is doubtful and how it is doubtful, I hope this, has, this, has a, this is a question which has come to my mind at present. I hope this will be answered by the experts by the end of this session and I will definitely like to know about it. Thank you very much. And I hope by the end of this session, all will be related with different answers which they have not yet found. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your insightful opening note. We are definitely going to discuss on this uh, topic which you had raised today. Uh, you had always been our inspiration. Okay, so today, our first speaker is Professor Shotodal Dash. It is a distinct pleasure to introduce you, sir, today. Dr. Shotodal Dash passed MBBS from Calcutta University with two college scholarships. He stood first in all postgraduate examinations, including Diploma in Clinical Pathology from School of Tropical Medicine, DBMS from Calcutta University, and thereafter MD in Microbiology from Calcutta University. He had received several training thereafter, including auto analyzer in Nyon, Switzerland, advanced real-time PCR at Mumbai, a programs on translational research at Bangalore, and finally, internal quality audit for medical laboratories as per the ISO 15181 at Kolkata. At present, he is attached to the Microbiology and Molecular Biology Laboratory at Peerless Hospital and BK Roy Research Center as a consultant microbiologist. He is also a principal investigator of Virology Laboratory at the Regional Research Institute, Government of India in Kolkata now. He has published 140 research papers in various journals and presented more than 200 papers in several national and international conferences. He also mentored 11 PhD students. Professor Dash has published many book chapters, notably one in the book Molecular Virology from Intec Publishers Germany, and another on the very interesting topic, Lunar Settlement by, uh, from CRC Press USA. 
he's an author of another book titled Handbook of Microbiology. Today, Professor Dash is going to talk about on the clinical aspects of the disease, some of its new symptoms and valuable discussion on vaccination strategies. So welcome, sir, once again. The stage is all yours now. Over to Professor Shratadol Dash. Okay. First of all, I should, uh, I should thank the organizer for giving me opportunity in this particular seminar. Now, it, it, just one minute, I, I, I'm sharing my slides. So actually, it's my topic today is a COVID-19 second wave evolution, then it's a risk and, the, and vaccines. Now we have COVID-19. Now the name COVID-19 uh, and, and that was given by WHO in 11 February in 2020 for a viral disease and the, uh, and the disease is, is caused by a coronavirus. Now the, uh, and this coronavirus we know, and there are many, many coronaviruses, these are particularly infecting animals, and there, uh, and there are some, some, inf some infecting uh, and there is human beings. Actually, actually there are a total seven viruses, these are seven coronaviruses uh, that can, that can uh, actually, actually infect all, uh, and there is the human beings. Among the seven viruses, we know, and the, the four viruses, they actually, they actually cause that common cold only. The particular is the 229 E, then, then there is the NL, the, the, the 63 virus, then the, the, the 43, and the, 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 the QC virus, and another is the SKU, and there is a SK, SK, uh, and there is one virus. And these four viruses are not, are not so important to us. They, they, they only cause the that common cold. And the remaining three viruses, uh, and, uh, and they're very important. Among them, the, the, the SARS virus, uh, and, the, and then the MERS virus, and, the, uh, and this new virus, the, the SARS coronavirus 2, and, and uh, these three are very, very important. It particularly the SARS coronavirus 2, it, it has already caused pandemic and, and there are many deaths. So in that way, it is very important. Now in the second way, now in viral disease, particularly in the RNA, RNA viral disease, we find different waves. Actually, it means that so there is ups and downs of the of the rate of infection of these of these infective agents. Now these the uh, uh, these waves, it uh, it usually occurs after a certain time period. Now the real cause of these of these particular waves are are probably the, the, the diminishing antibody level in the general population. A diminished a diminished heart immunity in the general population, or the appearance of the new uh, the, uh, mutants of those viruses. Again, uh, the, the, in, some, in, in some infectious agents, we find there are the seasonal waves. There is ups and downs in different seasons. So in that way, the, in this particular viral infection, after the first wave, we find the second wave up, uh, after the February, uh, after February uh, 2020, particularly in India. And, and the, the peak level is the achieved in 6 May. And after that, there is, uh, uh, there is gradual decline. 
So in that way, it is it's very important, uh, the COVID-19. Now, uh, although, although the first in, indication was that in the second wave began in, in Kerala, but officially, we know that if the, we know if the second wave starts in Amaravati of Maharashtra. And the strain, and the mutant strain we find, the, 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 the B1617 the, the strain, and, and there is a double mutant strain. In the double mutant, it means that the in RBT, RBT means it's a receptor binding domain. These mutations are present, there is a double mutation. Although, although many other mutations which may occur in other areas, but in the such a spike protein, the receptor binding domain or RVD, and these mutations are, are very, very important. So in that way, and this particular mutant strain, the, the B1617 strain, and this is known as the, the double mutant strain, and it is highly infectious, and the, and the, the, the morbidity of the mortality rate is very, very high. Now, so, so if we look the, 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 the different mutants in, in India, we find that, that there, are, uh, there are many mutants. About 14 mutants are there. Among them, important mutants are B1617. Again, this B, B1617, there are three, three variants. It are one, two, and, and, and three. Among them, the, the, the two variant, the, the B16172, and this variant is now known as Delta virus. It is highly, highly infectious. It can spread disease very easily, and there is a very high mortality and morbidity rate. So in that way, in that way, it is very, very important. The other two, the, the B16171, it is, it is known as Kappa virus. It is not so important. And B16173, uh, it is also not so important. If we look in that March, I, I, March 1, the, the, the 2021, we find that the, 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 the B, B1617, the, the two, B1672, uh, and that was a very, very minor virus. It caused, in, it caused infection in, in only a few persons. But we find that after April, early part of the April, it could spread for the India. And at present, at present, we find that only, only this particular strain the B16172, uh, and it is only prevalent for the India. Other strains are not, are not so important at present, and, and actually we are not getting them. We are only getting the, the B, B16172 the, the strain, or the, or the, the Delta strain. Now the, the, the rate of infection. If you, if you look at the rate of infection, then we find that in the first wave, as well as in the, the second wave, after 30 days, and there is there is gradual increase. There is st steep increase in the number of cases. But if we compare uh, in the first wave and the, the second wave, we find that in the second wave, the rise is very, very steep. So due to this difference, it clearly indicates that the infectivity in the second wave is much higher, is, is much higher in, in comparison to the first wave. Now, gradually, the, uh, this particular strain is now present for the India. 
and after 6 may it gradually declined and and i think that after july after july it will come down to its, to its base level as well as as well as present in february now now if we compare the first wave and the, the second wave in connection to the uh, the relative increase, uh, the, the, the biggest 30 day the, the increase in cases, we find that it is it is about it's three times more in the second wave. If we compare the relative increase in death, it is about four times more. If we compare uh, the relative increase in positivity to test, then, then it is about four times more in the second wave. And, and, uh, and if we study the patients, we find that if we compare the first wave and the second wave, we find that the main age group affected is in between the 30 and 50 years of age. But if the mortality rate is maximum in between the 60 to 80 years of age. And, and this is consistent in the first wave as well as in the second wave. This particular age group distribution in connection to the infectivity and the mortality. Although, although, although according to the sum that in the second wave, the affection of the children is more in comparison to the first wave, but analysis does not indicate such a limit. Actually, actually, this is because this particular virus, this particular virus cannot cause infection in children easily. And, and this is because the, 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 the AC2 receptor is not so developed in children. So the, due to this, our interpretation is that although or, or, or the most of the, uh, the media and some also the scientific persons, they declare that in the third wave, the children will be affected. But our, our clear cut idea, the, the based on the scientific data, indicates that even in the third wave, children will, will not be affected. It is not so easy. So, so in our opinion, in the third wave also, the, the similar pattern will be maintained. Now, there is a the, the peak, the, the rapidity of the of achievement of the peak level according to the number of cases, and, and there is the one lakh case. So, the the, the, the two achieve one lakh case per day. In the first wave, it required 100, 110 days. But in the second wave, it required only 62 days. So this also indicates that the infectivity of the virus in the second wave is very high. Now the symptoms of the COVID-19. So the usual symptoms of the COVID-19 in general is that fever over 100.4 degree Fahrenheit, is a cough or sore throat, a new soreness of breath. It means that the, the soreness of, of breath may be present in you know, many persons due to particularly due to COPD and the chronic obstructive the pulmonary disease. But this new, if there is new appearance of the soreness of the breath, it is important. And then chills, and also the, the new muscle pain. Uh, and there is new new loss of taste or smell, uh, uh, the nausea, the, the vomiting and diarrhea. Now, the, the nausea, the, the vomiting and diarrhea, it, it occurs due to the fact that the C2 receptors are also present in the intestine. So due to this, 
the, the some binding of the virus also also occurs in the intestinal cell as well as pathogenic the, the pathogenic changes also occur in the intestine and it is particularly prominent in the second wave then then there is a new new headache or excessive fatigue and the congestion of the of the runny nose so so actually these are the common symptoms which are found in covid 19 and in general particularly in the first wave these are fever and and these are dry cough and that was two very important symptoms we observed in the first wave fever in 88% 88% cases and and the dry cough in 68% cases other other symptoms are present but they are not so much prominent now in the second wave and these symptoms uh, there are also also some new symptoms among the among these new symptoms is the first that dry mouth and this dry mouth refers to a condition in which the salivary glands in the mouth actually do not make enough saliva to keep mouth wet so in, so due to this uh, and there is a dry mouth occurs then the covid tongue and the lesions in this condition the tongue may start to appear white and patchy it is it is due to the dry mouth Uh, and due to the dry mouth, and there is and uh, and there is white is color of the of the tongue, and and this distribution is a patchy distribution over the tongue. Then the gastrointestinal infection, particularly the diarrhea, the diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, and the nausea. So all these things are, are very very prominent in that second wave. now these uh, an conjunctivitis is conjunctivitis uh, this was absent in the first wave we find that the conjunctivitis is also present in most of the cases in second wave so actually the affected eyes are 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 red with the swelling so in that way in that way it is it is quite prominent in the second wave there is a fatigue extreme tiredness in the in the past wave tiredness was uh, and that was present and muscle and joint pain sir also or sufficient in the first wave but it is not so severe in the second wave we find that the extreme tiredness the muscle and, and joint pain are very very prominent even even after the, after after actually discharge from the hospital we we find that it continues for its long the, the long period even even more than a month so the, the steam tiredness and the muscle and joint pains are very very important in the second wave now in the loss of hearing and in the acral rashes acral rashes means the symmetric distribution of some rashes in, in the body they are also found but uh, but they are not so prominent and uh, they are found in few cases but important important point is that in that in the first wave which uh, these are not present with the loss of hearing or the acral rashes i the both are absent in that first wave so so these are some of the numerous symptom which i found in the second wave so another point another important point is that if we if we study the viral load if we compare that the viral load with the intensity of the symptom then then there is a paradox in the first wave we find that the the viral load is less but the symptoms are such very very intense but in the second wave we find that 
the viral load is very high, but in comparison to, to that very high viral load, the intensity of the symptoms is comparatively less. So, so it is a paradox, but it is very difficult, so it is very difficult to explain. Now, in the second wave, again, the fever is not so prominent. Fever is present, but, uh, but the fever is very, very transient in most of the cases. Again, the, the body ache, joint pain, and cough are, are comparatively mild, but it continues, it continues for a pretty, pretty long time. In the in the past way, usually it's a, they, they they present for only seven to ten days on an on an average in 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 most of the cases. But in the second way, they actually continue uh, in more than fifteen days and sometimes more than a month. And then the the difficulty in the breathing is also very, very prominent in the second wave. Now these are the viral load. We call it city value. These the, the, the threshold cycle, or, or in short, it is known as the city value. If, if we see the first wave, in the first wave, city value was in between 20 to 35 in most of the cases. But in the second wave, city value, it, they are present in between 10 to 20, 25 in most of the cases. It clearly indicates that the, the city values are comparatively mass, uh, and the mass less in the, in the second wave in comparison to the first wave. Actually, if the city value is more, and then the viral load is less. And if the, if the city value is less, the viral load is high. So in that way, it clearly indicates that the viral load is very, very high in the second wave in comparison to the first wave. <clears throat> And, and actually, due to this high viral load, the, 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 the infectivity is very high, and, and, the, and the disease could spread very easily in general population. And also, the, the morbidity and the mortality is also very high. Now, the gene. In RT-PCR, or, or that is the real-time PCR, we usually target some gene of the virus for diagnosis. In Bengal, we particularly targeted RDRP, RDRP gene, E gene. Then there is the then there is the warrant, uh, there is the one AB gene, uh, and there is the N gene. And these four genes we usually target it for the diagnosis. So accordingly, in different kits, we targeted either the two or three genes. According to ICMR guideline, at least the two genes should be, should be positive for a, for a, for a confirmed diagnosis. And we find that in all these such genes, the city values are much less in the second wave in comparison to the first wave. Now the, the cytokine levels. And these cytokines are the pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. In normal condition, they remain in, in balance. But in COVID-19, we find that pro-inflammatory cytokines are much more, are, are much more increased. 
Particularly, we are interested in IL-6 and IL-10. In, in normal condition, these two cytokines are the more important and they help in balancing in between pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory function. So due to this, in all COVID-19 patients, particularly in the, in the second way, we measure IL-6. If IL-6 is very high, then there is every possibility of development of a cytokine storm. Now, if there is a cytokine storm, and there may be the damage of the different organs of the body. Now, there are various changes, like the, the clotting changes, there may be shock, lung injury, cell death, immune paralysis, intestinal injury, injury. And, and this is followed by inflammation and multi-organ failure and death. So we, we always try to, to, to prevent cytokine storm in COVID-19 cases. And by, and, and by monitoring these IL-6, as well as in some cases, we also to measure the ferritin. The ferritin level also, also indicates if the cytokine storm. If there, if there is very high ferritin level, it can also induce cytokine storm. So in that way, it is very important that we should measure IL-6. And in that the second way, IL-6 is high in, in most of the cases. And, and the morbidity and the mortality of the, of the patients is mainly, is mainly due to of the cytokine storm in the second way. Now the, the viral mutation in the, in the second way. We know that the, the, the viral mutation is a natural phenomenon. And that occurs as a byproduct uh, during the virus replication. And it occurs significantly in RNA viruses. So in the course of, of COVID-19 pandemic, we should continuously monitor the, the genetic variants of the, the SARS coronavirus 2 and adopt, at, uh, adopt different strategies against them accordingly. Now, now we know that the, and the, the, there is some enzymatic auto repair for correction of the, the minor mutations in coronaviruses. And, and that is present that is the natural. But if this correction uh, that does not occur, then, then this mutation will keep on or not, will exclusively depend on natural selection. Originally advocated by Darwin and, and either and the Darwin and the Wallace in 18, 1858. Now, three important factors govern the natural selection of the mutants of SARS coronavirus 2. And the high degree of the replication, effective transmission, and immune, immune escape phenomenon. So, these three, three important factors, these three important factors actually. Actually, it's gone. And the formation of the mutants of RNA viruses, and it is applicable to the SARS coronavirus too also. Now, the natural selection is a solitary course to, to confirm magnitude on the variant of SARS coronavirus too. Now, the, uh, uh, the, the notable variants that you observed are at cluster five at, at present it is extinct and the lineage 
data B B one six one seven B one one data data two zero seven B one one seven B one three five one etc. And the notable mysterious mutants are also present. Now, now uh, actually, uh, actually, we should know about the, the silent mutation, uh, the nonsense mutation, uh, the mysterious mutation. Suppose if if at the if at the DNA level we find the, the TTC and the, the mRNA level it will be AAG and ultimately there is formation of the thalysine. Now sometimes there may be silent, the, the silent mutation. Suppose the, the TTC becomes TTT, even then there is formation of the thalysine. The thalysine is produced, but, but mutation is there. So it is a silent mutation. Now in that nonsense mutation, suppose the TTC becomes ATC. Then in the mRNA level, it will become it will become UAG. So it is the stop the, the uh, and it's the stop codon. So so UAG is a stop codon, so there is no formation of the of the protein. So there is no formation of the, of the thalysine. So it's the nonsense mutation. Then if you look to the missense mutation, then, then, if, if then suppose TTC becomes the, the TCC and, and TGC. In that case, um, the, the, the protein will be produced, amino acid will be produced, but, but it's a different amino acid, arginine and thrombin. So it is a missense mutation. So you find the, the in this SARS coronavirus 2, so all these types of mutations are there. There's the silent mutation, there's the nonsense mutations, as well as the missense mutation. So particularly missense mutations are very, very important. Now the, 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 the recent, the South Indian, the, the variant B, B1351, an Indian variant, we should not call it Indian at present, we should call it the, the, the Delta variant or the Delta virus. Now the B, B1617 is very, very important in that way. Now, now if you look at the SARS coronavirus 2, the, the particularly the Delta virus, we find the, 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 the double mutation virus and there is the one mutation is at uh, the e, E484Q and another is at L to the 452R. So these two mutations are very, very important in the Delta virus. Now, these two mutations are in the RBD. RBD means such a receptor binding domain of the spike protein. We know the, the, this particular area, the, the RBD. RBD will bind with the AC, AC2 receptor. Excuse me, sir, your mic is muted. Hello? Hello? It's all right, sir. All right. All right, sir. It is all right. Okay. So, uh, so if I uh, that in B, B1617, the, 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 the three variant, B16173 variant, 
we find another mutation and that is the p681 r r mutation and in this particular mutation the the e the the 484q is reversed now we find that and the double mutant with the delta virus is highly virulent in comparison to the uh, uh, and there is the, the one and three variant. Sorry, is there any problem with this slide? Now it is okay. So the double mutation in K in 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 key areas of the, of the virus spike protein and may make the virus more infectious, allow it to escape the immune system also. So the other mutants and, and the other and the mutations particularly occur in the RBD region. Now in in Queen's University at Belfast, they studied this, this particular Indian stain and found that in the second wave, this particular stain is, is 20 percent more transmissible in comparison in compre, in to the first wave and the virus. And now the most the, the vital question is that can we control or, or monitor the three stakes of the natural selection of the SARS coronavirus 2 mutant? That depending on high degree of the replication, effective transmission, and the immune escape phenomenon. So the first is the high degree of the replication, and this coronavirus has produced full length copies uh, during replication of the of the large genomic RNA. It is timed by two large uh, the open reading tracts. This 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 warf is very very important because there is no stop codon. In this particular in this particular open reading frames, that there is no stop codon, so there is continuous deformation of the different proteins. So in that way, a large number of the viruses can be produced in a very short time. And and the, and these two two or the one A and one B, and they are occupying two thirds of the genomic area. Thus, during replication, they produce highly variable sets of, of the, the limitedly conserved virus specific protein, which are determinant of pathogenicity and, and there is host reaction to the infection. But this high degree, high degree of, of replication can be prevented, can be prevented in these RNA viruses, even in SARS coronavirus 2, by the, the metal ions. And if there is parallel infection with some other viruses, which are not so important, then the replication of these viruses will be decreased. So, so you observe that in the last year, in the month of November, December, January, uh, and particularly the November and, and the December, the number of cases of this COVID-19 virus must less. It may be, it may be due to the infection of other the minor viruses. So due to parallel the, the parallel infection with the other viruses in winter season, their the, the incidence, their incidence virus less. Then if we, if we administer the viral components, then also there will be the competition and, and the, 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 the degree of replication will be lower. So in this way, there is a metal ion, the, the parallel infection with other viruses, and by administrating the, the viral components, you can, you can diminish by the degree of the, 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 the degree of replication of the SARS coronavirus. Then effective transmission. 
Now, effective transmission can be easily prevented by, by mass the, the vaccination program. If this mass vaccination is given, then the, the effective transmission will be easily prevented. And then the other preventive measures should also be taken. The, the general preventive measures, with particularly the safe distance, mask. So all these things should be used. But with the mass vaccination is a single entity that can easily prevent effective transmission. Then immune escape phenomenon. Now, now viruses implement multiple strategies to evade immune mechanism of our body. It has been found that interferons are not properly inducted in, in COVID-19 cases. We know interferons, they, they belong to innate immunity of our body. And in COVID-19, we, we find that interferons are not, are not properly produced or are persistent, it's de deregulated. Now, and there are also other, other ways of sudden Uh, and the term in relation to the innate immunity, the, the dosing. But again, if the vaccination program is effective, it, then you can control this immune escape phenomenon also. So in this way, I mean, the three, three parameters, the high degree of the replication, the effective transmission, and the immune escape phenomenon can be, can be controlled by its proper planning and proper scientific, with the scientific program. But the most important, the, the most important thing is that vaccination. Now at present, with the single dose vaccination has been completed in, in Bengal only in 80% cases. But we, we require it at least 70% as uh, the protection Either by either by either by infection or, or by vaccination. And the present at present scenario, we find that to achieve our target in India, we we at least to vaccinate 60 crores with the people to achieve our target, which is very, very difficult. Now, now if, if we compare the, the development of the, the vaccine, the, the, the development of the classic vaccine and the development of the COVID-19 vaccine, there are there must differences. In the development of the classical vaccine, the, the, the preclinical study should be done for 18 to 30 months. In COVID-19 vaccine preparation, there was no preclinical study the stage. The phase one and phase two trials, and they were also to, uh, and they were also to limited for a short period. In in classical vaccine preparation, phase one requires thirty month, phase two requires thirty two month. But in COVID nineteen vaccine preparation, only six month, uh, and that was given in the phase one and phase two. Again, the, the, again, if you see the phase three, phase three trial, the, the almost all corona, uh, the corona vaccine, the, the, the COVID vaccine at present, uh, there was no, no the, the phase three, three trials. And that is the most important phase. So without the, the COVID-19 vaccine preparation that was done, in a very, very short period. So proper standardization is very, very difficult. And there are many controversies. Now these are the variants. These are, uh, we know these are, these are patient vaccines. These are patient available vaccines are partially effective in that variants. It is not 100% protective of the variants, but our findings, 
of the of the patient treatment study indicated that the the persons the persons who took actually actually two vaccines the severity of the symptoms and signs and the and the complications and the morbidity and mortality are much less if we if we see there is a uh, if we if we only see if if we only see the the outcome of the treatment in in bangur hospital only we we find uh, approximately approximately 2000 approximately 2000 uh, approximately 2000 that uh, persons they used the diet and among them only six persons uh, uh, and there is diet and those are taken these are, these are two vaccines these are two doses of the vaccine so the the the, 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 the vaccination clearly indicates that it can prevent it can prevent to some extent particularly the severity of the disease in the second wave mm -hmm. as well as in the first wave. In the first wave, there was no vaccine uh, did properly. With the effectiveness of that vaccine, we, we find it clearly in the second wave. And our analysis clearly indicates that uh, there is a definite role of the, of the vaccination and the vaccination should be taken by all persons. Now, uh, the, the, if we if we look to the Astra, AstraZeneca, if the AstraZeneca vaccine is now is now is, is now used widely in India. Uh, now, AstraZeneca, if AstraZeneca first dose is taken, then uh, there is approximately forty percent prevention is there. The, the, even there is 40% diminished of the severity of the disease. And if the, the second dose of the AstraZeneca is taken, there is approximately 60% diminution of the severity as well as the chance of infection in, in connection to the Delta virus strain infection. Now, The, the, uh, if you if you look the, the development of the newer the, the newer strategies, you, you, then we find that in our body the, there are some of the natural genes. Those can prevent the, the SARS coronavirus two infection. The natural genes. Are present, but those can act against infection of SARS coronavirus 2 in our body. But the problem is that all the all these genes are usually down regulated in normal condition. So by any means, if we can develop some of the new medicine or some of the new 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 method by which all these down-regulated uh, the genes can be up-regulated, then we can easily, easily prevent the infection of the, the sars coronavirus 2 And the studies are going on in this slide. And in future, and in future, we know that the, the, in this year, particularly the, the, the 2021, uh, and there is complete the, the complete human genome the, the mapping, and that uh, and that has been done. Previously, there was 97 percent mapping, but at present, 100 percent mapping, uh, and that has been completed in this year. And so, in future. 
we can develop the recorded human genome. And, and, and this recorded human genome can, can resist the, 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 the different infections, even development of the cancer, even aging, aging also. So this is the future outlook. And the, the next generation, our next generation may, may see that the, 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 the human beings are recorded with their genome and, and, the, the, and there will be no disease. All, all these diseases will be diminished and there will be no fear about these diseases. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, sir, for such an informative session and new updates of, on the infectivity of the virus in the second wave and new symptoms that are appearing in the with course of time. We got important information on the epidemiological perspective of this viral infection and a an comparative account of characteristics of infections of the two different viral infectious wave. So now, before going to the question answer round, I would like to request all the participants who are watching us online uh, to fill up the feedback form. I would like to request the uh, team members to put the e your feedback form in the chat box. It will be available there. So you have to fill up the feedback form. Okay, so I can see a lot of questions are popping up in the different windows. However, due to paucity of time, uh, we'll be able to answer a few questions. Uh, so the first question, sir, shall we proceed? Sir, okay. yeah, yeah. So the first question that our principals are asked is since different uh, vaccines are showing protection against uh, some strains, but not against others. Huh? Some, uh, so thus uh, it would be nice if you can enlighten on this topic, sir. Some different, uh, different types of vaccines are available now, uh, no, which I, is showing. I, I, no, actually there are the controversies. As I, as I mentioned that, the third study, the third study and, and that was not done. So the, the efficacy of these viruses is not clearly known, but the, the, uh, the, the, they are claiming, the, 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 the companies are, are claiming the, 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 the protection level. Now, as for example, the, 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 the Pfizer vaccine, they claimed about the 90% the 90% protection. Johnson and Johnson, they claimed about uh, also 93% protection. But the, the co-vaccine, about 70% protection. And the, and our, the, the Covishield also, 60 to 70% protection. Now, the, the combination, the, 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 we cannot combine these, uh, these vaccines. Suppose it's a first vaccine is, is taken as it's provisional, and and the second vaccine cannot be given in a different brand. It is better not to be given. Right. Otherwise, right. Uh, otherwise it's a damage, it's a difficult in assessment. Okay. Right, sir. The second question is: It seems IL six is the main player causing cytochrome storm. So, is it possible to develop? Immune therapeutics to neutralize IL-6 in COVID-19 patients? Actually, actually, at present, if the IL-6 is at very high, then the medicines are given to the diminish the action of the IL-6. But that right. should be given right. very, very cautiously. Uh, right. And because there are also the problems in administering uh, the diminishing the, the action of the IL-6, I mentioned that right. it, uh, there should be a balance in between the IL-6 and IL-10. And mm -hmm. it is, if this balance is not achieved, then the patient may die. Right, so, sir. Right. So this, should be so this should be monitoring very carefully and, and very, very processed. Right, sir. Right. The third question uh, is uh, when the th third wave of COVID-19 is likely to uh, appear or how big uh, will it be in West yes. Bengal and what would be the probability of viral load in this? Uh, so in case we the, 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 the third wave. 
according to the ser 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 priority model ser isaya according to the ser the the priority model uh, the ser means such as susceptibility infectivity and 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 the recovery so in short it is known as the ser model the the ser prediction model it is it is a standard model for the prediction of the infectious diseases so according to the right according to right. the ser is a priority model third way in india is the third way in india will begin in the first week of august right and it will end in the uh, it will end in the last week of the october according right to, sir according to that the ser priority model but right, there is there are some controversy according to some according to some it will begin in the november now right, now the the if proper vaccination is uh, are given and if we take the proper uh, the, the proper preventive measures we can prevent it but another point is very important is although all the most of the persons so they are telling that in the third wave the, the children will be affected but uh, according to the scientific data according to the scientific the, the findings it is clear that the, the children will not be affected right sir right so we we come to the almost the last question we'll take only one more question does corona virus damage lung com, uh, completely or permanently yes actually actually the main problem is the fibrosis right so, right sir uh, the, the fibrosis in the lung we call it organization the, the organization means sometimes what you find that uh if the infection is much more then body try to control it in its limited uh, area so in that way right. uh, right. the alveolar level of the of the lungs if they produce the body produce fibrosis right to limit the spread of infection mm -hmm. but uh, but as in the alveolar you know there uh, there is the gaseous excess so if there is fibrosis gaseous excess will be altered Oxygen level will, will gradually diminish in that body. So right, that right. is the problem, and we should, mm -hmm. we should, we should diminish that fibrosis. So the medicines mm -hmm. are, are given to to diminish the fibrosis, and uh, if the fibrosis is, is more, then the patient will die. Right, sir. Right. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, oh, we have come to the end of our first session. Uh, now we would like to start the last session of our webinar series but before that i would like to introduce you with our next guest speaker professor partho sharathi roy to all of you it is indeed a great honor and privilege to have you sir today dr partho sharathi roy obtained his masters and phd degree from the department of microbiology and cell biology indian institute of science bangalore His PhD research was on molecular virology, especially on regulation of protein synthesis in hepatitis C virus, a highly infectious virus against which there was no medicine or vaccine. Thereafter, he pursued his postdoctoral studies at the Lerner Research Institute of Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Ohio, United States, during which he worked on the regulation of inflammation and angiogenesis. making many seminal discoveries including the one of the first rna switch in mammals he returned to india and joined the department of biological science at indian institute of science education and research kolkata in 2008 where he did his where he is an associate professor his current research is focused on understanding the cross talk between micro rnas and rna binding proteins in the regulation of inflammation and cancer dr roy has published his research in prestigious journals such as nature cell molecular cell nature cell biology and oncology he has got multiple recognitions and fellowships in india and abroad such as indian academy of science associateship and welcome trust dbt indian alliance fellowship he has wide research interest from molecular biology to evolutionary biology to even linguistics dr roy has been closely associated with the fight against covid-19 pandemic 
in the various way and in in a part of community of science he is a part of the community of scientists currently consulting with the world health organization on viral evolution and emerging mutations today sir is going to talk about his valuable insights and perspectives on covid-19 and the mystery of rna virus as a whole over to you sir yep uh, thank you uh, deep deep uh i would like to thank the organizers the faculty members of the department of microbiology of shrinath college uh, the principal and especially the students who are attending this webinar uh it's a it's a nice opportunity for me to be able to uh, talk uh, to you all i have had an old association with shrinath college i was originally a, stu a student of physiology in presidency college and would sometimes visit the physiology department in shrindranath college on some occasions so it is uh, good to know about the department of microbiology in shrindranath college and to be able to participate in this webinar so i think there is a lot of this interest about the covid 19 and uh, dr dash in his in his talk which he has given he has enlightened about many aspects of the of of the viral mutation and on this uh, on the various you know like the symptoms of the infection so uh, i will sort of go on a on a, on a on a different trajectory and try to talk about uh, some uh, of this of this entire field of rna viruses and pandemics and how they are caused and what we are learning from this from this covid 19 uh, pandemic so my interest in or association with this covid 19 pandemic comes from multiple aspects of my scientific interests uh, as devdeep has mentioned i am originally trained as a virologist and i have uh, been looking at viruses for quite a long time my current research interest is inflammation and i have been working on inflammation for the last nearly now 15 years so the covid 19 its major pathogenicity is caused by inflammation and a hyper inflammatory response so that is also an uh, of an aspect from which i am associated in this covid 19 uh, uh, pandemic and thirdly i have i have also had a long standing inter interest in evolution especially evolution of viruses and therefore this this emergent mutations and variation in covid 19 is also something uh, on which i have had a long standing interest so from this three aspects of the virus of of inflammation and of from viral evolution i have been in, interested or involved in in studying the covid 19 pandemic and i'll today share some of my uh, some of my uh, ideas or 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 interest in this matter so let me try to share the screen okay so what i'll sort of talk about briefly because i'll i'll leave more time for the questions is a covid 19 second wave the viral origin evolution and pathogenesis so there is uh, i guess all of you uh, are aware now there is lot of discussion about the origin of the virus also which is going on uh, which is this controversy about whether it is a it is a result of the of a spillover or a jump from an another animal or whether it is a result of a accidental or deliberate leak from a lab so this this uh, origin controversy is also now part of the uh, of, of all these different aspects of the covid-19 pandemic so basically the question which is the what we know about the this viral pandemic till now is that that there is this uh, that this outbreak of this novel coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2 it is called SARS-CoV-2 because there was an earlier SARS that is the uh, the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus so coronaviruses are viruses which are around us for quite some time many of the common cold which all of us suffer from every year is caused by coronaviruses but some of this coronaviruses cause this severe pneumonia type disease which is called a severe acute respiratory syndrome and the first such coronavirus which caused this sars was uh, happened in 2002 and therefore that is called as sars cov and therefore this was named as sars cov 2 
and the SARS CoV 2 was identified in Wuhan, which is a city in the Hubei province of China in December 2019. And this, this causes the severe acute respiratory syndrome together with other associated syndromes, which is together characterized as this coronavirus induced disease 2019. That is how the name COVID-19 has come, coronavirus induced disease. And it was declared as a pandemic on 11th March 2020 by the WHO. A pandemic by definition is an, is an, is an epidemic caused by a microorganism which, is, which affects every continent of the world. So as this affected every continent of the world by 11th March, this was declared as a pandemic by the WHO. And as of today, there are more than 176 million cases in 187 countries and territories world resulting in more than 3.8 million deaths, recorded deaths. There is definitely much more number of deaths than this, especially in countries like India, where it looks like that the deaths are highly uh, undercounted. Around 160 million people have recovered. So this is also we should understand that most people will recover from this, uh, from this infection. Actually, in 80% of the people, the infection is actually asymptomatic. This is good news in some way. That means most people will not be affected by a severe disease and therefore will not require hospitalization, will not be, uh, have a health crisis. On the other hand, this is also bad news in some way because each of these asymptomatic persons can also infect other people and spread the virus. That is why wearing masks is such an important way of preventing this, this, this pandemic. Or, or keeping yourself protected because you do not know whom you are meeting with, whether he or she is infected or not. Therefore, wearing masks is known to cut down the infection rate by around 99%, and it's an easy way to do it. So therefore, uh, th there is so around 20% of the cases are symptomatic. That means they will show symptoms. Among this also around 15% will be very mildly symptomatic where the, where the symptoms will resolve in a few days only around 5% people requires hospitalization, okay, with a, with a severe uh, disease. And among this 5% people also, the mortality rate overall comes down to around 0.1 to 0.5%. So the number of people dying is less. So if we have a, have a good medical system, which can, which can manage this number of people who are coming to the hospital, and on the other hand, if the infection rate can be reduced, then we should be able to to prevent this pandemic from causing further harm to the world. But we know that this pandemic in the last two years or so, or in, in the last one and a half years has nearly brought the entire world to a shutdown. Now, the question is that whether this is the first such pandemic which we are seeing, that is not the case. So this is not the first such uh, pandemic uh, which is there. There have been other pandemics uh, before, there have been influenza pandemics in the 20th century. In the last century, the most, uh, the, the biggest of these pandemics was what was caused by the span, uh, by cause called the Spanish flu, which was caused by this influenza virus A strain, H1N1 strain of the influenza virus in 1989, 1919, just after the first world war, when, when people were, when soldiers were actually going back to their homes all over the world. And this has estimated to have caused around 20 to 50 million deaths. Okay. And among these deaths, around apparently one third of these deaths were apparently in India. So India had a huge mortality from this, uh, uh, from this uh, Spanish flu, the H1N1 epidemic, which happened in the 1918-1919. Then in 1957, and, but we should remember at this point of time, and as you are microbiology students, it is important. And by this time of time, viruses were not known. So people didn't know that what was the causative agent of this, of this pandemic. Okay, so there was a lot of, you know, like uh, uh, confusion about what was caused it. But even then, if you go to uh, and see photographs of that time, you will see the health workers were still having, you know, masks on their faces. All right, which means that people identified or understood that masks could actually stop transmission because any airborne virus like an influenza virus uh, its transmission can be stopped by wearing masks. So then the next such big pandemic was in 1957-1958, which was called the Asian flu caused by the H2N2 influenza virus, which is estimated to have caused one to four million deaths. By this time, because already the virus has been identified as a causative organism, ways to prevent 
transmission of viruses has also been identified therefore the number of deaths as you can see was much less then there was the hong kong flu uh, which was ca caused by the another influenza virus h3n2 in 1968 which is estimated to have caused 1 to 4 million deaths okay so in the pandemics in the 20th century 21st century there was a pandemic caused by the h1n1 virus which is all of you know it which causes the swine flu uh, now in this time because it was thought to have come through the uh, to the swine the pig in 2009 estimated to have caused 400000 deaths so these are influenza pandemics in the 20th and 21st century which we already have an experience of which are now part of the textbooks of virology so we had no reason not to be prepared for a for another pandemic especially there have been earlier pandemics by by the by corona viruses also as i said before there was the first sars uh, corona virus outbreak in 2000 to 2004 which was caused by sars cov 1 which infected around 8000 people worldwide and 775 people died okay so because it was it was it was much more localized okay and it didn't infect before it infected many people it could be stopped there were the the mortality was much less then there was the other virus another sars another corona virus called the middle east respiratory syndrome virus the mers which had multiple outbreaks in 2012 2015 and 2018 in saudi arabia and south korea which actually could kill 35% of infected people so in the in terms of mortality this viruses had much higher mortality so here the mortality is around 35% whereas as i just said the mortality in the uh, in in the case of the of the sars cov 2 is around just uh, around 0.2 to 0.5% so we are lucky that it is not a virus such as the mers virus which is now spread uh, which has caused this pandemic then you can understand what the mortality rate like the deaths number would have been here we are seeing this large number of deaths just because the there is much larger level of infection which has happened worldwide therefore the much more absolute number of people are dying due to the due to the pandemic i don't know what's happening anyway so i, I hope this is visible So anyway, so uh, now the question comes as that that how do does this virus suddenly appear? No one knew about this SARS-CoV-2 before 2019. So how does this suddenly this new virus has come? So one of the ways in which new viruses appear is by this process called zoonosis. Okay, zoonosis means the 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 transfer of a virus from one host species to another host species. Okay. and zoonotic viruses have been have been well known for example the hiv which is the uh, which causes this disease called aids acquired immunodeficiency syndrome which all of you know about is also a zoonotic virus because it is it is thought to have been jumped from other like primates like apes to humans because there is a, a related virus in the in in monkeys called the simian immunodeficiency virus so zoonotic viruses a zoonotic transmission of viruses is is known to happen for example the bird flu which you have heard about the influenza virus strain h5n1 is known to have jumped from wild aquatic birds like this birds like ducks which migrate from uh, in different parts of the world all of you must have seen migratory uh, birds from and they sometimes come into close contact with domesticated birds like for example chicken or ducks and the virus is thought to have jumped from one such domestic from a wild you a bird to a domestic bird and from there it is thought to have jumped into pigs okay and from pigs it is thought to have jumped into humans so this this h5n1 the the bird flu is known to both infect pigs and humans okay or directly from the from the domesticated bird to humans so this virus is known to have therefore jumped from one species to another and to have caught this caused this bird flu so in the case of the other coronavirus also which is known to have caused this type of uh, uh, pandemics 
there they are also known to have jumped from animals to humans for example the sars cov 1 the first coronavirus which caused the first coronavirus uh, pandemic the uh, sars in 2000 2004 is known to have jumped from this animal called the civet cat civet cat is also found in india it is this uh, uh, animal called as the bham in bengali from there it is known to have jumped into humans the mars cov the middle east respiratory syndrome virus is known to have jumped from camels to humans so it was present in camels and in the case of sars cov 2 it is thought that the the transmission has been from bats to humans either through or without an intermediate in this in this antiter called as a pangolin okay so bats are known to be viral reservoirs for many viruses so many viruses are found in bats for example another virus which of the which there was an infection in india a couple of years back was is the, the nipa virus which is also uh, uh, is is actually found in bats so here in this case also the virus is thought to have been transmitted from bats to humans either via pangolin or or directly so this is something which is uh, which is the the basic understanding in the scientific community how are these things studied actually how as as students you would ask that how is this thing studied this is studied by what is called as a phylogenetic analysis of the viral genome so if you put all the viral genomes together the viral genome is basically this rna sequence in the case of this of the sars cov which encodes all the proteins which finally makes up the virus so you can you can basically you can you can put all this viral rna sequences together and then look for commonalities in the sequences by using various types of mathematical programs so this is called as phylogenetic analysis so this program finally gives rise to this type of what are called as trees they are phylogenetic trees where closely related viruses will show up as this related viruses closely related in terms of their of their genome sequences and looking at the trees you can basically tell that which virus is related to to which virus okay and therefore in this one you can see that the sars cov 2 which is which which is present over here as a virus this actually is closely related to the sars cov 1 which was uh, which was first uh, 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 the first corona virus and this is its its closest relative is the sars r cov btk y72 which which you see over here which is a bat corona virus okay so this is therefore the what we called as the closest relative of this and then there is another bat corona virus which is again a close relative of this of this uh, viruses so this virus this sars cov btk y72 is now is also known as the rat g13 because this was a bat corona virus which was found uh, from a cave in the in the zhejiang province in china so this therefore a very closely related corona virus which is 96% similar to this to corona virus has been found in the in the bat so this is what is basically known from this type of phylogenetic analysis and this is something which is still going on because exactly the same virus this, this is 96% and this is still 4% different the exactly the same virus has not yet been found but it takes quite some time for this research to actually find the virus which is the most closely related to this uh, to the actual virus which is infecting humans so now the question is that how does this virus change its host species okay how does the virus suddenly as i'm saying jump from one host species like the bat to another host species for example like humans so for that we uh, sort to need a uh, know a little bit of the molecular components of the corona virus so any virus okay is basically nothing but a combination of a of a genome which is either rna or dna and some proteins okay this is the most surprising thing about viruses that they are they do not have a brain they do not have a nervous system they do not have anything which gives them intelligence okay they are nothing but a combination of molecules okay a combination of molecules which just follows okay the laws of evolution the laws of natural selection which is the i would say is the only sort of law in biology okay which is all uh, which covers everything in in biology so this the the corona virus basically has an rna genome so a, a genome which is composed of a single rna which we called as a positive stranded rna positive stranded rna means as soon as this rna enters into our cells the host cells it will start getting translated to produce proteins okay and it has some proteins which form the structure 
Okay, so this includes this M protein, which is this membrane protein, which you see this green green protein, the hemagglutin in ester is dimer, which is a, a structural protein and envelope protein, and N protein, which uh, basically I get, I'm sure you would have heard it from DJC sir, Professor Dhruvajyoti Chattopadha, because his lab has been working with an N protein for a long time, which is part of the, which combines with the RNA and E protein. And very important, this, this pink, type of stud, this nail-like protein, which you see are jutting out of the virus, which is called as a spike glycoprotein, okay? So this spike glycoprotein is a protein which is present on the, on the viral surface, which the virus uses, okay, or which enables the virus to basically interact with the proteins on the surface of their host cells. Now, just as the virus surface is decorated with the protein, our cells, Okay, the host cells are also decorated with proteins. Okay, so I'm sure you all of you have know about the uh, the structure of the of the of our cell membrane and how there are uh, you know transmembrane proteins and integral membrane proteins and uh, peripheral membrane proteins which are all present on our protein surfaces on on the surface of our cells. So one such protein on our on our cell surface is called this ACE2 angiotensinogen converting enzyme 2 which is a which is completely which has a completely unrelated function in our bodies okay it is involved in in, in regulating blood pressure actually so the by chance and this happens always by chance by by evolution the the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 can actually interact and bind tightly with this ACE2 protein on the surfaces of our cells okay and then with the help of another protein called TNPRSS2, this virus can be internalized. It can go inside our cell as the part of a, of a membrane bound vesicle. And then this basically will, from, from the membrane bound vesicle, the viral membrane will basically fuse with this membrane bound vesicle and will release this RNA into our cytoplasm, into our cell cytoplasm. In this cell cytoplasm, the RNA will immediately start getting translated. It will use our cells, it will hijack our cellular machinery to translate its own RNA to produce the viral proteins, okay? These viral proteins will form a enzyme. One of these enzymes is a, is a key enzyme, an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which will now make copies of the viral RNA, okay? So it will first form a negative strand and from a negative strand, a positive strand will, uh, will be copied. So it will produce many viral RNAs and from this positive strands will get further translated to produce more and more viral proteins. And these viral proteins and viral RNA will get packaged inside our cell and will finally break open the cell and will come out. As it breaks the cell, the cell will die. That is how this will cause cellular damage. And as more viral particles will be produced, this can now infect further cells. This is how the infection will spread in our bodies. Okay, so this is how basically this, this viral, the viral replication happens and the virus multiplies in our, in our, in our bodies. Now, therefore, the key between the ability of the virus to infect is basically this interaction between the spike protein and this ACE2 protein, okay? And this is basically what we see over here. And what we now know, or what we have known for a long time is that small changes in the spike protein, okay? And the spike protein is just composed of amino acids. So small changes in its amino acid composition can cause it to change its interaction. And that is the key to both the, the origin of the virus as a zoonotic virus by which it can infect uh, human cells and also this ability to form more and more variants of the virus, okay? Because the spike protein will keep on changing a little as the virus, you know, makes copies of itself. The reason why, this, why the virus can make copies of itself is because of mutations. Mutations is a part and parcel of all biological replication. So every, every uh, type of, you know, like changes in, in, in biology is driven by mutations. So mutation is a natural process, it's a random process where we know that the DNA from which the RNA is, is produced by transcription. Okay, so if there is a change in the DNA by the, during the process of replication, because the replication process is not 100%, you know, uh, foolproof in any organism. There is a, because the replication happens by, by enzymes and enzymes have a certain error rate. So they make a certain number of mistakes, just like any machine makes a mistake. 
okay and when it makes a mistake it incorporates a wrong nucleotide in the in the when it is copying a certain sequence and this mutation in it will give rise in some cases when there is a when there is a sense or a, a, a when this is a sense mutation okay it will give rise to the change in the in the amino acid many mutations and this mutations are called as mis sense mutations then there are many mutations which are called silent mutations because they will not cause a change in the amino acid sequence but mis sense mutations can cause a change in the amino acid sequence and the produce will have a will be different from the original protein now what is known is that 99.9% of such mutations are actually deleterious okay it is it is something which is not good for the cell or for the virus in, in the matter but a 0.1% of the mutations give some sort of selective advantage okay it allows this organism to replicate more to produce to multiply more so for the virus to make more copies of itself okay or it can make the virus to also change host species okay so this process is random so there would have been some virus some bat which would have had this virus or a pangolin where this mutations would have happened once that that came into contact with a human then this it would have been able to infect the 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 human okay and this mutation rate is in, in various organisms in known so you can see in this graph over here the mutation rate actually is also inversely proportional to genome size so longer the genome bigger the genomes you will always have a lower mutation rate because if you have high mutation in a in a in a long genome then you would introduce so many deleterious mutation that the organism will die very soon okay so mutations are are less are more in smaller genomes you can see higher eukaryotes have the lowest rate of mutation then lower eukaryotes then bacteria then double stranded dna viruses and you can see that rna viruses have one of the highest mutation rates which you can see in this in this plot okay the reason is that the rna viruses have this rdrp this rna dependent rna polymerase which i talked about which is highly error prone okay its error rate is pretty high all right its error rate is so uh, rdrp an rna dependent rna polymerase with a high error rate has also got selected in this viruses because this this allows this viruses to mutate faster and give rise to variants okay so as it was known that this viruses can give rise to variants okay we should have been actually been prepared that variants would have come up and i fortunately unfortunately in india i guess i was the first person to talk in last year 2020 in april itself in an interview in the week magazine i had warned against the possibility of variants you know uh, uh, evolving in this virus very fast but i guess the government or the people didn't pay much heed to it uh, but as a virologist we knew that the chance of variants coming up in this virus was pretty high okay and this is already known from this if you compare the the genome or the spike protein of this of, of this of sars cov 2 with the spike protein of other uh, 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 of the other known coronaviruses is it this can be seen more and it can't be seen okay of this you can see that there have been mutations in this in in this uh, in the spike protein so this is the spike protein sequence which you see over here it has two subunits the s1 subunit and the s2 subunit and the s1 subunit has this very important receptor binding domain or rbd through which it interacts with the uh, with our ac2 uh, receptor but this protein actually which is produced as a as a as a uh, large protein it needs to be cleaved at this site over here between the s1 s2 and this cleavage happens by an enzyme which is present on our cell membrane called as furin okay it's a it's a furin cleavage site and this cleavage is very important for it to interact tightly with our with our ac2 receptor and this furin cleavage site actually evolved in this sars cov 2 virus over here which you can see it is not present in the other other coronaviruses including the very closely bat this rat g13 coronavirus which is very close but you can see there were mutations which had happened in this virus which it shares with the bat and the pangolin 
okay and there are some mutations which is specifically shares with the uh, with the pangolin uh, sequence which you can see over here which is not there in the bat for example this t uh, with this t this uh, this s with the s this q and the q so it looks like that this virus originated in the in the in the bat and then it somehow underwent a recombination okay it can also undergo recombination because two viruses can also infect the same animal so by a, this is called as co infection so it underwent a recombination with with a pangolin coronavirus also possibly and then underwent this mutation give which gave rise to this furin cleavage site which now made it a a virus which can infect humans okay so this is already which was which was known and therefore this variants which would come up is also something which was expected and this is exactly what happened so even in 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 basically in uh, in in 2020 there were already in very early pretty soon after this uh, the pandemic started there was already this this three types of of corona weather and they were being called types at that time which had spread all over the world so the viruses which had spread all over the world during the the, the first wave of the pandemic was also not the same virus because they had already undergone changes so the type a is this virus which which i just showed you the sequence of it is closest to the coronavirus found in bats and pangolins and it is considered to be the root of the outbreak in in wuhan okay and it was two subclusters was found which was one was linked directly to wuhan this is the subcluster which was found from this wuhan animal market when animal uh, wild animals uh, flesh is sold and this is possibly the site where such transmissions can take place very easily and then there were two subclusters which was one was common in america and australia so this 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 yellow uh, line shows this uh, the spread of this type a and it was also the type which caused this huge mortality in spain during the early part of the first wave then this gave rise to this type b Uh, which was which was the one which actually spread in wuhan in the wuhan also the virus which spread was not the original virus it was already a mutant version of the virus by and there were two mutations in it and uh, and this mutated very rapidly outside china and this was the one which spread all over the world actually okay and which was the one which spread in europe all over in canada in in brazil etc this was the uh, the type b and the type c is one which is mutated from type b okay and this this was originally found in singapore and from there it was found to spread to uh, europe via there was this uh, cruise ship via which this actually spread to europe so in the last pandemic in, in the last wave only the first wave only it was known that this virus could actually change and now all of us are aware that this virus has actually mutated or evolved okay very uh, fast actually over this over the course of the last one year and now we have so many variants which are present over the world okay there are now thousands of variants actually which are present and the who there is a committee of which i am also a part this is a 200 member international committee which actually looks at all this this variant sequences that it comes up how how it spreads and uh, now there have been they have been designated they have all originated in different countries but because so that these countries are not stigmatized because the virus the variant originated in this country they have now been given this greek letter names and the variants have been named as variants of concern where which shows that either that variant is more transmissible okay that means that it can actually transmit faster okay or it shows more virulence okay that means it shows higher severity of the disease or number 3 it shows immune evasiveness that is it is able to evade the immune system of the host okay all these three things are important things which allows a certain variant to be selected okay for example this this united kingdom this b117 the uh, the the virus this actually took just two weeks okay just within two weeks it it increased in number to 0% to 65% of the entire uh, uh, infected uh, samples okay so the so it can once it has a even little bit of selectional advantage as we cause so if it is a little bit more transmissible it's a little bit more infective it will spread through the population very fast it will basically push out all other viruses and it will spread through the population very fast 
So this alpha B117 was the first major variant of concern which spread all over and now it is the major variant all over UK and Europe and also in the India. In India, this was the, the major variant in the second wave actually. It spread very fast all over. Then there was the South African variant B1351 and the gamma B1 of Brazil, okay, the, which are now designated as beta and, and gamma. Okay, These variants also showed higher immune evasiveness. That means, so the first one, this United Kingdom, the, the, the alpha variant didn't show immune evasiveness. So the, it, the immune system, including the vaccine, okay, could identify this as good as the, as the original virus against which the vaccines are made. Okay. But the, then this two, the beta and gamma also showed ability to evade the immune system. Okay. And the Delta variant, which originated or which came up in India, shows both higher transmissiveness, okay, and shows ability of immune evasiveness. So it is more transmissive on one hand, it is also able to evade the immune system better on the other hand. Okay, and therefore it has, it is spread, it, ha, it has spread so rapidly, and it has also caused more severe disease. The reason why the disease has been more severe in this case is not because the virus is more lethal as such, but it is able to evade the immune system. Okay, escape the immune system more efficiently. And then there are a number of variants of interest. Okay, Epsilon, Zeta, Eta, Theta, Iota, Kappa, and these are increasing every day nearly. And these have been found either in multiple countries, which means that it is uh, this uh, mutations have independently evolved in multiple countries, or these have actually spread fast from one country to the other, or these have shown multiple clusters in the same country. So based on this, these have been named as variants of interest. Okay. So this is something which is which uh, uh, we should be aware. And something which should be also we should be aware is that all the vaccines which are there are against the spike protein usually. Okay, so, uh, so the vaccines, I will not go into details of the vaccines, uh, maybe a little bit I, I'll go into because already Dr. Das has talked about them. So vaccines are of different types. I'm sure you have already heard from the other speakers. So there are some of the vaccines uses the whole virus which has been attenuated or killed, okay, this is the, for example, the co-vaccine in India is, is this type of a, uh, of a, it's an attenuated viral virus, okay, where the whole virus has been, has been killed and that is being injected to evoke immune response. Then you have this adenoviral vector-based vaccine, which is the COVID shield, where uh, another virus, okay, uh, a chimpanzee, basically virus which doesn't cause any disease in us has been engineered to express the spike protein of the coronavirus. Okay, so it is like a virus which has a coronavirus spike protein on it. And then there are all these mRNA vaccines, okay, which is produced by the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, which there is an mRNA encoding the, the spike protein, which will, be, which will be injected into the body. And there it will express the spike protein and that will give rise to the, uh, to the immune response. Now, most of this, therefore, the vaccines are targeted against the spike protein. And on the other hand, the spike protein is the protein which is mutating the fastest. Okay, so all these variants now which you see are variants in which the, the spike protein has been mutated. Okay, so this is the spike protein, as you can see on the top is this RBD, the, the receptor binding domain. And all these mutations are basically in this receptor binding domain. So this B117, this uh, the the UK uh, the variant which was first evolved in the UK, it has this had this mutation in this N. N is a asparagine. All of you, I'm, I'm sure know it's an amino acid which has got changed to a tyrosine over here. And that this single mutation, together with some other mutations, so whether it's a deletion here, this other mutation has made this so highly transmissive. Okay, then this the South African variant B1351. Together with this N501, there was a mutation E484K and K471N, which you can see they are also in this RBD of the spike protein. Then B1128.1, which is this, which is the Brazilian variant, there they also there was the same mutation. And then you can you see that this K471 is mutated to a T. Okay. So Therefore, two things which you should notice here. Number one is that all the mutations are in the spike protein and in the RBD. And these mutations are all at the same mutations are independently evolving. You can see the same amino acid. So it is not that the same virus got transmitted from, from uh, England to, to South Africa to, uh, to Brazil. 
So this is called as convergent evolution. That means because these mutations are happening randomly, but as soon as a mutation is giving some selective advantage to the virus, wherever be it in England or in Brazil or in, or in South Africa, it will be selected, okay, as a as a virus with more, you know, ability to to infect. And that is exactly how the Indian variant has also been uh, has also got selected this B one six one seven point two where this E again the same E four eighty four has been mutated to Q and there is a new mutation this L over here has been mutated to an origin in R. This mutation is new. This has this has arisen in this in this uh, uh, Delta variant which we now see in India. Okay, and this uh, uh, people are thinking has made this. Ability, uh, given this ability to evade the immune system. So as we are talking now, the virus is evolving. And therefore now, as you can understand, the vaccines are against the spike protein and the virus is also mutating in the spike protein. So at some point, there would be a virus, okay, which will be, which the vaccine will be ineffective against. Okay, so this is now basically, this is called as an evolutionary armed race. Okay, so as if, like there is a race happening between the, uh, the between the so the and the virus is actually running, whereas the vaccine the vaccine is actually made against a single virus, a single viral sequence. So the vaccine is standing still. Okay, so this is something which will which is not possible to sustain for a long time. The virus will keep running, the vaccine will keep still. That is not happening. So the vaccine also has to be updated. Okay. So the idea of the vaccination is, is to be able to vaccinate as many number of people in the shortest possible time, such that the virus doesn't get enough hosts to basically replicate because these mutations can only happen if the virus replicates. If the virus is outside our body, it cannot replicate because the virus is completely dependent on the host for replication. So by taking preventive measures, by wearing masks and maintaining physical distancing, being very conscious about it, if you can prevent the virus from getting fresh hosts on one hand. And on the other hand, if you can vaccinate as many number of people in the shortest possible time. In this way, I would say the Indian government strategy is some completely wrong because if you stretch the vaccination over a year or two years, it is not going to help. The vaccination has to, be, has to happen in the shortest possible time to, to basically starve the, of the virus of the hosts. And that is what countries like the USA or in the Europe they have they have uh, done they have they have uh, pushed through the vaccine in the shortest possible time because this is a very clear understanding in virology which should be which should be there. So this is something which we should understand that the vaccine is not running currently because there is only one type of vaccine against only one viral sequence which is currently the virus is running that is basically it is already in the race all right we have to. We, in order to defeat the virus in this race, to be, to be able to prevent the third wave and the fourth wave from appearing, we need to, on one hand, try to have the highest number of vaccination as short as possible time. And on the other hand, maintain all the ways and means by which the virus doesn't get fresh hosts. Because if it gets fresh hosts, it will be able to replicate. Okay, So that is something which, uh, uh, which we should be conscious about. We should also be conscious as, as you are students of microbiology, we should know that where cancer species jumps happen and how we should uh, uh, prevent it. Because this is now a very interesting field in, 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 in microbiology called as emerging infectious diseases. Microbiologists now travel to all parts of the world. And I'll tell you one very short experience of mine also, where people actually look for where such emerging infectious, uh, infectious diseases are emerging. And this happens in, in cases where there is this illegal wildlife trade and markets. A lot of wildlife is illegally killed and traded okay, for, for meat and for various body parts. This is a place which, where this can happen. Then man, animal, human, animal conflicts. You keep on hearing about you know, humans and leopards in, in tea gardens uh, in the doors or, or, or elephants of Dalma you know, coming into human villages because of habitat loss. Okay, so habitat loss for animals, okay, is a major cause which is causing this human animal conflict animals to come into close proximity to humans. And this is something which is which is very dangerous because this will give rise to future such pandemics. Okay, and then finally climate change. Climate change is causing such major changes in the world's climate that lot of uh, uh, pathogens, microbial pathogens, bacteria, viruses, you know, uh, 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 parasites, 
which are now getting access to newer hosts now, which they didn't have. Okay, and this will also give rise to further pandemics in the future. So, as students of microbiology, you would be the frontline warriors against these pandemics in the future. Therefore, you should be conscious about the, this thing, which is actually contributing to microbial pathogens finding new hosts and being able to cause such future pathogens, uh, future pandemics. Okay. And finally, I will come to a little bit about the, uh, the actual course of viral infection and the host immune response. So, see, the virus itself doesn't cause too much of, of damage. Okay. The virus infects the lung cells, actually the alveolar cells of the lung. Okay. The, the cells which line the, uh, which cause this gas exchange surface of our lungs and it causes this, this cells to die. So this causes the direct uh, cell death in the lungs and affects and cause starts the disease. But the major reason why this disease happens and why this disease causes the severity, okay, is because this also gives rise to an inflammatory response. Okay. Now, infl the inflammatory response is our body's, you know, protective response against any pathogen. Okay. But it is also a double-edged sword. Okay. It can cut on, on both sides. So in Bengal, it is called a shakher korat. Because on one hand, it is a protective response. On the other hand, if it goes out of control, then it can cause much further damage to the body. And my lab actually studies this. My, my lab studies chronic and unresolved in, uh, inflammation. Normally, inflammation gets resolved on its own. Okay, it goes away on its own. And all of you have seen that if you get a heart, the place becomes, you know, red, it becomes painful, it, you, you get a fever for a couple of days, maybe then it goes away on its own. But when it doesn't resolve on its own, it can give rise to this disease. And that is exactly what the coronavirus, the COVID-19 does, basically. So as you can see, it enters into this lung epithelial cells, this alveolar cells, there it basically causes a uh, uh, in, uh, it activates okay, a number of molecules inside the cells. And some of these molecules are molecules like NF-kappa-B, okay, which, which are inflammatory mediators, an inflammatory molecule. So this will basically cause the expression of inflammatory genes. Okay? So this will release some proteins. Some, one such protein you have just heard about is, is a cytokine, IL-6. Okay? On the other hand, it will also cause the death of this cell. So the, this cell will die. And parts of the cells, okay, which are called as DAMPs, okay, DAMPs start, stand for damage associated molecular patterns. This will be recognized by our own body's immune cells, okay, neutrophils and macrophages as something which will activate them. So these neutrophils or macrophages will then get activated and they will now release all these different inflammatory molecules, which will cause damage to our cells which will actually kill the cells. This includes things like interferons, IFNs, IL interleukins like IL-6, tumor necrosis factor, IL-1B, etc. And it will also activate a number of other cells. Okay, uh, uh, NK natural killer cells, dendritic cells, T cells, B cells, etc. This together, when this goes out of control, so this will happen like a cascade. Okay, a cascade is like a waterfall. So just as a cascade gains momentum as it happens, this process will also gain momentum as it happens. Okay, and at one point it will give rise to what is called as a cytokine storm. When there would be so much amount of this cytokine, this molecule such as IL-6, IL-1 beta produced in the body, that it will cause the overall cellular damage to happen. Okay, and that will cause lung damage. That will that will cause water accumulation in the lung that, that is called as edema and that will prevent the person from being able to breathe actually and that is how people will undergo hypoxia that is low oxygen in blood and they will finally die. All right. This is also the way why there are so many other organs of the body also gets, uh, gets affected by the virus because these inflammatory cytokines will, will activate this immune system in all other parts of the body and will cause various cell, uh, immune reaction against the heart, against, uh, you know, like the liver. So there, there are the liver damage happens, heart damage happens, uh, neuronal damage happens, all these things happen. And therefore, this so people who also survive from COVID-19 are now showing, especially in the US uh, and, the, and in Europe, where people have many people have survived from COVID-19 because of better treatment in some way, they are showing this is what is called as long COVID, okay, or post-COVID, where people have overall damage in various organs of the body. 
together with lung damage. And in the lung, there is fibrosis basically, which is happening. So therefore, all these different things need to be basically targeted therapeutically. Doctors who are treating uh, this patient should talk with virologists, microbiologists, inflammation biologists to, to, to actually develop treatment protocols, okay? Because it is not the work of one single person or one type of doctor to be able to treat this thing because this is a very complex scenario. And therefore, also to be able to understand who are the patients who are who can become serious after the COVID-19 infection? These various types of inflammatory markers, they should be checked, okay, in patients who are who have got infected to see that if their levels show a high level, then it should be understood that that person can become severely affected by the disease. So, for example, interleukin-6, as we as you have just heard, if, uh, if it crosses a certain threshold level, lactate dehydrogenase is actually a lung enzyme which gets released into the blood if there is lung damage. This C-reactive protein, CRP, ferritin, which is an iron uh, uh, binding protein, D-dimer, which is a marker of, of, uh, of blood clotting, and N-terminal pro brain type uh, natural NT pro BNP, all of these have prognostic or diagnostic values in being able to judge the, the severity of, a, of, the, of the viral, of the viral of course, uh, SARS of COVID-19, and be able to understand whether that patient is going to become severe, is going to go into a ventilator, or is, will, is going to have a mild infection. So this is something which, which, uh, and this is still developing more such markers is, is coming up. My lab works with one such protein called gelsolin, which turns out to get severely reduced in COVID-19 patients, it looks like now. So these are some of the things which is there is, uh, 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 which we can talk about. So uh, Devdevi, can I have five more minutes uh, to sort of talk about another interesting thing? Yes, sir. I, I, yeah. Yes, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Okay, so this is just an interesting project, which so as just I said that this viral evolution and pandemics has been, uh, you know, it is something new to most people, but this is something about which virologists and people have been have been interested or have been concerned about for a long time. So I have also been concerned about this type of evolving or emerging viral, you know, like uh, pandemics. And I had a hypothesis long back when I just came back to India that the ice sheets, you know, like the polar ice sheets where there is there is huge kilometer deep, you know, like uh, ice caps are there. This can be reservoirs for multiple airborne and waterborne viruses, many being pathogenic to humans, animals and plants. Because we know that viruses can remain because we also store viruses in minus 80 degree or liquid nitrogen for many years. So if there are viruses in this polar ice caps, then they can also remain active but dormant for thousands of years, theoretically, okay? And these viruses, they would have been evolved. They might have evolved even before humans would have evolved. So we would not have any immune memory of these viruses, okay? There would not be any protection against these viruses. And because we know that global warming is causing the melting of these ice caps, all of you know about this, if the, these ice caps melt, these viruses can come back into the circulation again by coming back into the water or in the air. And then they can infect humans or any other species and can cause worldwide pandemics. So this was a basically a hypothesis. So this was about so many years back when we, when people like me were already thinking of this type of viral pandemics. And basically this is the sort of thing which is known. So air current, so this is something which involves geograph, ge geologists, geographists, you know, hydrologers, uh, uh, microbiologists, all this type of people. So we know that because the air and water moves from warm areas to cold areas because air and water is lighter, okay, has less density in warm areas and they have higher density in cold areas. So air and water currents move from the tropics to the towards the two poles. And the tropics have the highest uh, uh, microbial diversity and the, therefore there would be this air and water will carry various types of microbes and they can move towards the two poles where they will become dense and they can fall as snowfall on these two poles. Therefore, microbes can historically, historically means all over the like in the geological ages would have been carried from this tropics and would have been carried to the poles and by snowfall, they would have been deposited on there in the, in the, in the poles, okay? And this as the polar ice cap thickens, there would be more and more layers of ice over there and there would be viruses in this. 
So basically, it is estimated that 10 to the power 19 viable microbes melt out of glaciers worldwide each year. With warming, these numbers can become much, much higher. Okay. So I had actually proposed a project where we wanted to, I wanted to go and core into the Antarctic ice cap, okay, into the polar ice and actually sample for viral genes over there. So basically, if we if we know about these viral genes, what these genes, these viruses have beforehand, then we would not be in such an unprepared state as we were in this pandemic, basically. And this is, there are, this is known, a large number and variety of microorganisms, including bacteria, fungi, protists, and viruses have been recovered from the interior of glacial, glacial ice cores dating back beyond 400,000 years. Then a specific plant virus, a tomato mosa mosaic tobacco virus, have been found in glacial ice subcores from Greenland, ranging between 500 to 140,000 years. And the influenza virus H1 strain RNA has been isolated from lake ice from three lakes in Siberia in 2006. So basically in 2015, therefore, I went on an Antarctic expedition to, to the uh, to this uh, Indian uh, Antarctic field station called Bharati in Antarctica and there stayed for, for three months and got this ice cores basically and sampled, you know, RNA, viral RNA from this ice cores. So this is some pictures of Antarctica, which you can see that the glaciers, this is the Indian research station over there. There I'm standing in front of this research station. Someone took this photograph. And this is this Aurora Australialis, which you can see from the research station. Then there are penguins, so there are wild animals also, and they can also uh, get infected by these viruses as, as the ice melts over there. And, and these are these ice cores which were isolated from here. Okay, and uh, this is not my, but because this work is still continuing, these ice cores are kept uh, in, a, in a secure location in this National Center for uh, Oceanography in Goa. But from this ice cores, this type of cyanobacterium and virus particles have been found actually. Okay, so therefore, what I would like to end by saying is that unless we are prepared, unless microbiologists today and microbiologists of the future, unless governments listen to microbiologists and virologists who are talking about these things, who are, who are trying to do research on these things, then what I can say is that we will most probably survive the current pandemic, but we will not survive the next pandemic. Okay, therefore, we should be prepared, we should be careful and both in the short term and in the long term. I would like to thank, uh, end by thanking all of you for your attention and I would be ready to take any question. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable insight on this current pandemic situation and the role of RNA virus in this such a catastrophe. Sir has emphasized on mystery associated with the origin of coronavirus as well as uh, the long-standing questions on immune evasion mechanism, the convergent evolution, spontaneous mutation that is happening, and above all, the mystery that was associated with the coronavirus origin, the origin of the virus. So now uh, we also, an important piece of information was uh, shared by Sir on the computation and analysis of the viral genome and the information that we obtained from it as paper that was published in Nature Microbiology from Scripps Research Institute. Uh, we also understand uh, the lessons that we learned uh, the, in the previous pandemic and how we implement those knowledge in order to win over this current situation. So now, before going to the question and answer round, I would again like to request the, all the participants uh, to please feed, uh, fill up the, the feedback form uh, as an appreciative gesture. Uh, okay, so now we have come to the most interesting session of our concluding webinar, the question and answer round. As expected, the chat boxes are flooded with questions. We will try to address as many as possible today. Uh, as sir is, be, is going to be available for today only. So the first question that is uh, coming, I will just take a minute. There are so many chat boxes. So the first question that is coming, uh, you showed that a furin cleavage site is not present in any of the related zootonic viruses, but SARS-CoV-2. Do you believe such precise site can evolve naturally? 
yeah so uh, this is one of the things which is doing the rounds now a lot because uh, someone has written that it this site is possibly engineered but this is completely a wrong idea this type of sites are present in other viruses okay there is another it's not a beta corona virus but there is another corona virus which was isolated from a patient in hong kong it's it is called as human corona virus 1 which we had known about also which has a furin cleavage site like this so this type of furin cleavage right. sites are present in other corona viruses and some of this corona viruses have already been known to infect humans in the past okay so th this right. corona virus you, you can also go and check uh, there are sequence available in the in the uh, sequence database is is called as hcu1 okay it, it is basically a hong kong uh, was isolated from hong kong and this had a furin cleavage site so furin cleavage sites are known to be present in many such corona viruses actually right right sir the second question is during the first wave everyone was talking about herd immunity but in the second wave nobody is talking about it is it because the scientists and doctors have started to believe that the concept of herd immunity is not going to work because the virus is mutating too fast not at all i think herd immunity is still very important why do you think that the second wave suddenly declined so rapidly okay right sir the reason is because in, there has been such high levels of infections in these places that most people who have been asymptomatically infected okay have developed herd immunity right. so otherwise there is right. nothing to explain this very rapid decline of the second wave it, it happened mm -hmm. within days actually okay mm -hmm. so herd immunity will always be in place okay the herd immunity is basically this this 80% asymptomatic people who are getting infected they will develop uh, uh, they, they will cannot be further infected and whenever you have very high levels of infection there could also be very fast levels of herd immunity okay right right so basically the reason the multiple waves come is because the virus changes so the herd immunity would be against one particular type or the variant of the virus if the virus mutates the antibodies mm -hmm. which were generated against the different or the earlier variant of the virus will not function that is why this multiple waves come actually okay so mm -hmm. either it will infect you know uninfected people or it will infect people who have been infected before but do not have immunity but every wave will give rise to herd immunity of its own right sir right okay so, so the next question is uh, does corona virus affect nervous system uh it is not uh, it does so there is one of the of our receptors of this corona virus has been found which is called as neuropyrin okay neuropyrin is another receptor of this corona virus which is present on nerve cells and it is thought that the interaction of this of the corona virus with the neuropyrin actually gives rise to this loss of the sense of smell so many people have right. loss of sense of smell and this neuropyrin right. is highly enriched in the uh in in that in that part of the of the brain which controls the sense of smell so it is possible that or also in the nasal sinus okay so it, mm -hmm. it is possible that the corona virus also infects nerve cells because there is a receptor specific to nerve cells right sir right 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 the next question is we have seen many cases of treatment of covid 19 with antibody cocktail and patients are recovering from the even severe symptoms within a span of one week how successful would it be this antibody mediated treatment despite its obvious shortcoming what is the future of this vaccine uh, of the vaccines as a whole i mean this is a very so, wide question i believe yeah no first of all the antibody cocktail see the antibody cocktails are basically antibodies against some of these inflammatory factors okay so this antibody cocktail which uh, Uh, which Eli Lilly has developed, which is now being given to some patients in in India also. This is against two of the cytokines. Okay. Similarly, one of the uh, one of the antibodies which was being given to patients already, which is already approved in India, was tocilizumab. Okay, which was against interleukin six. It's an interleukin six monoclonal antibody. So these antibody mm -hmm. cocktails are basically against these inflammatory factors. All right. So. Mm -hmm. the question therefore is that there are two thing number one they will have only a very narrow range of of utility okay that is right. at a time right. when this when this 
uh, inflammatory cytokines are going very high at that point only if you can give the antibody cocktail it will work okay because if there is already lung damage the antibody cocktails are not going to work all right and number 2 is that this is a very you know uh, even as the as dr das said this is a balancing game so you do not want mm. the immune system to get suppressed that so that it cannot fight against the virus itself on the other hand you do not want it to get hyperactive so that it doesn't cause damage to the body itself so this is mm. like walking on a tight rope so this mm. antibody cocktails have to be given at such a time and at, and at mm. such doses where mm. it will not suppress the immune system as such on the other hand it will not cause the immune system to cause damage to the lungs as such so i don't think it is so easy to do it so i don't really think it can be very widely uh, it, it can mm. be applied all over the country right sir so sir uh, and the question next question is like uh, this virus is uh, is there any effect on the epigenetics like uh, on the on our immune gene expression uh, like uh, is can it modulate the gene genetic exp gene expression of the uh, genes which are um, uh, taking care of the immune system in the any permanent damage it can cause it can cause all whole lot of immune uh, change in the immune system i am currently working on a on, on this exactly the same project actually right. so basically looking at rna binding proteins which this virus is able to affect of our our rna binding proteins and right, can change right. our own gene expression so it has been mm. shown to change methylation of genes it has been shown to affect rna binding proteins it has been shown to affect transcription factors and this right. is not just new for this virus every virus there is this whole field called as host pathogen interaction yeah, whenever yeah, a absolutely. virus infects our cells okay mm. it will it will it will modulate the host gene expression also mm. so that is mm. known in in, mm. in case of every virus and sars cov2 is not uh, uh, like a exception to that also right right so so in the in the beginning we got to uh, hear that this virus was very difficult to cultivate is it possible to culture now this in lab yeah it is now possible to culture so it is uh, but you can understand it can only be cultured in bsl3 or bsl4 facilities but it can be cultured yes. so there are many right. viruses which are very for this this hu1 uh, the virus from hong kong which i talked about it it could never yes. be cultured actually it can infect humans very well but it could never be cultured even in on human cells but this virus yes. can be cultured yeah right sir so we'll take one or two more questions sir shall we take two more two more yeah. questions yeah. the questions are important so i think uh, yeah okay sir okay so most states in india are in the state of full or partial lockdown now we are seeing a decline in new cases but would it, would this number spike once again after the restrictions are lifted see in india it is very difficult to tell about anything because in india no clear data is is available so all data i would i am very sorry to say is basically fudged in india i mean neither infection data nor death data it and uh, and what the government or whoever is charged with data doesn't understand that without proper data for scientists to be able to say any such thing is impossible right 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 sir uh, yeah it's, it's completely see, scientists are not astrologers to yes, be able to, to be able to tell something uh, to be able to predict something you we need data okay right, so it sir. is very difficult to say uh, uh, without this type of thing without data i can say as a thumb rule only thumb rule means from general understanding of of virology there mm -hmm. will not be an immediate uh, spike because again as i said there would be lot of people who would have developed immunity herd immunity against not herd immunity but immunity mm -hmm. against this virus but mm -hmm. what will happen is that as people will come out this virus mm -hmm. will find new hosts again and will undergo replication and will undergo mutation and will give rise to new variants which will show again a spike or a surge pretty soon right so sir. that is why the preventive measures have to be in place like as i said like wearing masks maintaining physical distance not going for this large congregation starting from marriage parties to uh, election parties and also trying to rapidly vaccinate the vaccination i hope people or the government understand is a time limited process it cannot be indefinitely stretched out hoping that we will be working with one vaccine and the virus will wait for us right sir right sir so, uh, so the vaccination as rapid mm -hmm. vaccination as possible should be done yeah right sir 
so in the even in with uh, with the related to vaccination strategies like there are numerous companies are available many people are confused like whether should we should they go for a direct mrna vaccine or a virus cloned virus like adenovirus cloned vaccine like covid shield or something so do, can you shed some light on that see till now all the approved vaccines internationally have shown some efficacy okay so i would say that they are of comparable efficacy so any of the vaccine is okay the covaxin which is there in india i cannot tell anything because there is no uh, clinical uh, third uh, stage clinical trial data available so they have been telling for the last 3 months that there will be data but there is no data besides okay. covaxin other vaccine there is data available if we go by the data there is uh, more or less similar efficacy the efficacy again this variants have really not been tested so much yet so we really don't know efficacy against for example this delta variant which is there from india we don't know the uh, so much about the efficacy but more or less the vaccines which you can get are more or less equivalent and right sir right sir also the question which uh, the principal asked about combination of vaccines i cannot mm-hmm. tell about a combination of covid shield and covaxin because the covaxin is very difficult to say anything because data is not there but there has been a study done called combivax in spain on 6 600 mm-hmm. people with a combination of first dose, uh, dose of covid shield okay mm-hmm. which is this astrazeneca vaccine and the mm-hmm. second dose of the uh, mrna vaccine and right, this right. people have all shown a much higher antibody response right right sir Okay, so, so this is this is actually this phenomenon is known. Right. It is called as heterologous antibody response. So actually, because multiple different pathways of the body get activated, so combinations right. actually is expected to give a better antibody response. Right, sir. Uh, next question, sir. Uh, establishing ex- infection in new host often require numerous adaptive changes. Is there any possibility of coexistence of virus with human in near future? coexistence of this virus you're saying of vi- uh, virus as a whole and we are coexisting with virus i think this question yeah, is self explanatory and uh, means most infectious viruses or most disease causing mm-hmm. viruses also pretty soon become what as what is called as endemic okay so we have pandemics epidemics and endemics endemics are viruses which are coexisting which are among us which show outbreaks in some places or some uh, you know time of the year all of you are familiar with dengue okay dengue virus dengue is also a virus is a negative strand rna virus okay uh, dengue virus is an endemic virus so every year we are prepared that during the monsoon season there would be a dengue outbreak okay similarly influenza virus influenza virus is an endemic virus so every year the virus mutates it changes and then it, it causes a, a new you know like a set of infections so we have to coexist with virus our immune system is basically evolved also to coexist with viruses all right, right but sir. we have to therefore on the only thing we have to be we have to be careful we have to take prevention is to prevent this type of host jumps and right, most so, of right. these host jumps happen as i talked told in my talk is because of human activity you know illegal mm. wildlife trade cutting down trees forcing animals to come into into locality you know climate change etc so if we control our human activities right then so, i right. think we can, uh, we will be able to coexist much more peacefully with viruses right okay? sir right but we will have to coexist with viruses right sir Okay, so uh, we have come almost to the end of our session. Uh, I, I would like to again thank sir for uh, his precious time and uh, the no- and the knowledge that he has shared uh, with us. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Professor Shuchandra Chatterjee, Associate Professor at the Department of Chemistry and the IQSC Coordinator of Shuchandranath College, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Dev Dev. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, a uh, very warm and blissful to all of you, respected speakers, worthy the members of Shurendranath College family, valued viewers from different institutions, and my beloved students, virtually gathered here for today's concluding webinar session of the third three-day webinar series. covid-19 
second wave, evolution, risk, and vaccines. Organized by Department of Microbiology, Shurendranath College. It's my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks for all the nice deliberations throughout this series, patient hearing, and all the hard work behind the scene that made this program a reality. In the frightful backdrop of the first evolving double mutant virus, SARS-CoV-2, to evade our immune system, this webinar series actually tried to throw some light on the evolution process of the coronavirus, the impact of it in the second wave, and finally, about the vaccination process for building up the ultimate immunity against COVID. We started some one month ago on 12th of May with a comprehensive lecture by Professor Dhruva Jyoti Chattopadhyay, followed by a knowledgeable oration by Professor Shujoy Kumar Dash Gupta on 19th of May. And then after a big gap due to Yash, finally today we had another two very impressive sessions from Professor Shatodal Dash and Dr. Parth Sharathi Roy. On behalf of IQSC Shudendranath College, I sincerely thank all of them, all the four speakers. Thank you, ma'am, for your valuable feedback and appreciation. So uh, with this, we conclude our seminar on COVID-19, evolution, risk, and vaccines. Thank you.